570303A. Why is it that so many Christians find it so hard to live the Christian life? Phoenix, Arizona, USA. Let us remain standing just a moment till we meet God in prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee today from the depths of our hearts for the privilege that we have of calling Thee our Father. We read in the Bible where the Spirit would cry, Abba, Father, my God, my God. And we're so happy today that we've been included in this great number of the redeemed. And we're here this afternoon for no other purpose but to worship Thee, to read Thy Word and to find out how we could be better servants of Yours and to live a closer Christian walk for You and with You. And we pray that You will meet with us around the world and will give to us that deep desire that we so want in our hearts. And we we'll praise Thee for ask it in the name of the Son and the Lord Jesus. Amen. Be seated. I'm so happy to be here this afternoon service in the service of our Lord. And I trust that our little gathering together will be to his praise. And now many of the brethren, the brethren that's with me, were assembled out in other places today where they have having worshipping. And the place where I was at this morning we had a wonderful time over to the Assemblies of God Church and we had a wonderful service and I know you did also. And we're thankful that you are out this afternoon and we feel that somehow we just can't get enough of God. And there's something about the gospel and that of God that we just simply can't seem to get enough of it. I believe you could, you might eat too much sometimes and you might drink enough good cold water to make you sick. But I don't believe that a man could ever pray too much or get too much of the love of God in his heart. That's just one thing that just doesn't seem to ever get enough, fill up. And I'm taught that when we eat, if we're used to eating small portions, our stomach shrinks to that portion. And if we eat much, our stomach stretches to that. And I think we need some spiritual stretching and get much of the word. Can't be satisfied with just reading a little verse once in a while or something of that manner, but stretching our spiritual gastronomics. If I'm not mistaken, is in this brother and sister Peterson sitting right here from Minneapolis. I believe I've seen Captain Stadsklev here, your son-in-law last night, a chaplain in the army. I don't see him today. Yes, here he is over here. Well, you're going to be here through the meeting, I suppose, and I hope to get to see you before coming out. I want to go to the post with you, if the Lord willing, while I'm in California. Well, we're going to read just a first part of one verse and part of another verse out of the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, and that is the 26th, and I mean the 36th, and the 37th verse. The 26th and 27th verse. A new heart also will I put within you, and a new spirit that I will put within you. Then the 27th verse, and I will put my spirit within you. Now, as we have before us this text, we trust that God will give us a context from this. And we are trusting solemnly in the Holy Spirit to bring out the context of this text. In the Bible, there are many great gifts. God has set those gifts into the church in order for the perfecting of the church. And now, I wish to take my subject this afternoon on this. And to you who are writing it down and so forth. And for the tip, why is it that so many Christians find it so hard to live the Christian life? I think that would be seemingly to me a very vital subject this afternoon. Why is it that some seem to be on the housetop all the time, and others seem to have the ups and downs all the time, and others seem to be practically in the valley all the time? Getting the letters and the reports and the meetings sometimes lead me to prayer to find what would the Lord have me to speak to the church. For in the letters, and sometimes it's night time when the anointing of the discernment is on, you seemingly you could find that confusion. And them spirit that seems to be just some of them rejoicing and some sad and some disappointed and sometimes the Holy Spirit brings us to such subjects as you have this afternoon. Now we're speaking of Ezekiel, some eight or nine hundred years before the coming of the Messiah. In the Bible, the prophets, the word came to the prophets in the days of old. In Hebrews it said, God in sundry times and never manner speak to the fathers by the prophets, but in his last day has spoke to us through his son Christ Jesus. Now the prophets were seers, divine seers, and at the change of the dispensations from grace 
from law unto grace do not change God sending still prophets. For in the New Testament, we find prophecy went on just the same. And also prophets went on just the same. Prophecy is a gift. It's a gift that might be on one and then on another in any local church. And everyone may prophesy one by one. But a prophet is an office of the church. Not a gift in the church, but an office of the church, a prophet. They are not, they are ordained, predestined by God's foreknowledge to be what they are. They are born prophets. Prophets are not made, they are born prophets. And a prophet or a seer in one word is considered in the Old Testament as eagles. And how I love to think of it in that way as an eagle. I put much of my life in conservation, as you know, and studying wildlife, studying birds, wild birds, wild animals, learning their nature, and I find that an eagle is the most interesting bird nearly that I know of outside of the dove. The eagle is a bird of prey, but it's also a bird of the heavens. And in a certain book, reading one time, where a terrible sight to see an eagle in a cage. And this eagle, this great mammoth bird, would get back and fly against that cage as hard as he could, only to hit his head and come back, fall on the floor, look around. He'd frog his great wings against the cage again. He'd just been caged. And as he flogged his wings, he had all the hide and feathers beat off his wings, off of parts of his body where he had so stretched to get out of that cage. And when he would hit the cage, he'd fall back. Weary eyes would look up towards the heavens. He knew he was born a heaven-soaring bird. That's his nature. That was a sad sight, one of the saddest I've ever seen. But I've seen a sight in Phoenix and the world over that's a much sadder sight than that. I see men and women who are born to be sons and daughters of God and were killed by the devil, and to see them walk in the streets in lust and passion, caged in by the devil, when really they should be free sons and daughters of God. Now an eagle could fly higher than any other bird there is. There is no bird can climb where the eagle flies, and neither was there any man who, whether he was a teacher, evangelist, pastor, could ever climb to the spot where the prophets went, for they went way up, and higher you go, the further you can see away. And this bird was made no other bird could stand it up there. The eagle's eye is the sharpest eye of any bird. Why? He can outdo the hawk in any way. Because the hawk has a sharp eye, but just for a certain distance. But the eagle is more powerful because he goes higher than the hawk. He goes up to where the hawk would die if it tried to come to him. His body is not made like that. Oh, how I could stop right here by the help of God and show you how some people are trying to climb to places where others stand. It just wasn't made that way. You just can't stand it. And these eagles would go up. Could King Hezekiah ever climb where Elijah was? Though he was the greatest man in the kingdom, the king, but when he turned his face to the wall and dropped bitterly, God spoke to Isaiah to go tell him. Isaiah could climb where Hezekiah could not. Though Hezekiah could speak a word here on earth as a hawk, and everything bowed at his feet, Isaiah couldn't do that. But Isaiah could climb into a place where Hezekiah couldn't climb. All these things are for purposes. So God's eagle, Ezekiel, climbed up into a place to where he could see some 15, 18, yes, 2,500 years ahead seeing things. If you could go so high enough above the earth, you could see night and day at the same time, dark on one side and light on the other. So, you could see the world over if you could get high up and your eyes could focus to that. So Ezekiel climbed up so high that he saw our day, God's eagle, and he told us what would take place in this day. Now, I want to ask you something. The church seems to be out of cater somewhere. Now, we've got at least a good hour here. So let's just sit down and take our helmets off and listen just for a few minutes. Now notice, if God intended his church to be run upon intellectuals, then he doesn't take the Holy Spirit to do anything in the church. We do not need the Holy Spirit if the church is to be run upon intellectuals. Then we should find the smartest man we could find to be a pastor, and the biggest buildings that we could build, and the more members you could get into our church. 
the root out the illiterate and bring in the intellectual better the church would be if that is a program if that's a program the smarter the preacher the smarter the congregation the more intellectual they are the better the church will be but i can't put one place in all the holy scriptures where god's church is to be run upon the wisdom of men and as long as we try to run it upon intellectual of man we are absolutely fighting the air god's church to be run up by the baptism of the holy spirit then if we have the baptism of the holy spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to run the church, then it doesn't take too much intellectual. It doesn't take education. It takes the Holy Spirit. The last goes program. Now, we know that we don't have to find the smartest people in the city to make our church better. We don't have to find the best dressed people in the city to make our church better. We don't need the biggest crowds in the city to make our church better. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit to make our church better. Intellectuals have very little to do with it. I'm not trying to support illiteracy, but education has taken the place in the church of the Holy Spirit. Education is all right, but that is not God's program. If education was to take the place, Christ would establish schools when he was on earth. Christ never did establish a school, but Christ established a church. And not a church of intellectuals, but out of a bunch of literate fishermen who are willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and be led accordingly. Now, the church doesn't need a group of intellectuals. The church needs a bath. The church needs to be born again. If the Holy Spirit is going to lead the church, then the Holy Spirit will lead the church. Not according to some ritual, but according to the Bible. So this is the rules he laid down in the beginning. The church needs a baptism. The church doesn't need a polishing up. I better call in a pulpit. I better dress man. I better dress congregation. It needs a new heart. Is what God, is what the church needs. It needs the Holy Spirit. It needs that great action that changes men and women's lives. How God promised that he would take the old stony heart out and put a new heart in you. And then when this happens, a change has been made. Now, in preaching these things, even to the Pentecostal people, and we have very little to brag about. For in where we have tried to have a Pentecostal free move of God, we have become a place of a bunch of colonized cars almost. Just a place of confusion and discord. What ought to happen here this afternoon? There should be every Pentecostal church in the city jammed into some big stadium out here somewhere. And if it wasn't for little petty differences among the ministers and the people, it would be that way. A new heart will I give you. Not I'll polish your old one up, but I'll give you a new one. Now you, it's hard. We think it's hard to preach truth against the Baptists, Presbyterians, and the intellectuals. But it's twice as hard to preach the truth before Pentecostals. That's right. But the Bible has told us that you can't put a new wine in old bottles. That one stumbled me. I couldn't understand. A bottle, as I know it here, and we in America, is a glass affair. And what difference would it make if you put wine in the new bottle or the old bottle? But when I was in the Orient, I learned that the bottle in the Bible day was not a glass bottle. It was a bottle that was made out of animal skin. They taken the skin from the animal and turned it. And as long as the oil from the animal skin is in the skin, it's flexible. But when the skin gets old and set and dry, then it isn't flexible anymore. Bless the Lord, this skin becomes dry and sets. Then it won't give no more. And to put the new ad fermented wine that's got life in it yet into a skin like that wouldn't be wisdom. When the wine begins to ferment and to stretch, the skin bursts and you lose both bottle and wine. Jesus said in another place, cast not pearls before swine. You lose your pearls. And you take a church that is so set in its way, let it be Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever it is, that it's so set that when the new wine comes in and the wine comes by the word and that new word begins to say, the days of miracles are here again. That old dried up skin will, when that new one begins to take a hold, it can't move because it's set in what it believes. It won't move and the skin bursts open and pop, open, pop. You don't believe in miracles. There you are. When the Holy Spirit begins to say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that falls in an old dry church hide, you know what happens? They just blow up. That's all. If you say the baptism of the Holy Spirit was promised on the day of Pentecost to you and your children, and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, the old dry skin just bursts open, and you lose your someone. That's right. 
it doesn't do any good. And I'm ashamed the Pentecostal skins are drying like that. That's right. Come back to the world. Notice. Now, a new skin, he said, new wine is put into new bottles. And the new skin has oil in it, flexible. And then when the Holy Spirit comes down and says, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same today as it ever was. Divine healing is the same as it ever was. That new wine begins to spread out and the skin gives with it, every time that of God is preached in its power, the new skin will holler, Amen. It will give way. So, you see the wisdom in a new bottle for new wine. On the day of Pentecost, there's a 120 new skins laying on the floor. Now, you find out the old skins was cast outside. But when God came from the heavens and filled these new skins, they got new life and began to bounce all over the floor even bounce out the door and through the windows into the streets new skins with new bottles new wine holy ghost wine poured out full of life just stretching and giving and oh brother john i don't care what denomination you belong to i love you anyhow and there you are i don't care whether you're oneness twoness threeness fiveness we are brothers that's a new skin whether we are assemblies church of god four square Whatever we are, the new skins stretch, plump out, and take in every brother there is around. But the old cowhide won't do that. That's right, it won't do it. Somehow, it just won't do it. It's all dried and set, and it'll burst. Some time ago, up in northern British Columbia, I was hunting. After a great meeting, I was so tired, and I went back about, was about 1,100 miles from a heart of food. About 175 miles back, with 21 horses and I got to chasing an old bear that day it was raining and I didn't want to shoot the old fellow I just wanted to look at him and was determined I wasn't going to do that and a little horse about three years old that I tried ever since I bitten riding him uh, to throw me and went up to the hills we went chasing this old bear and somehow or another trying to cut across this glutch and over that I got turned around well now you don't want to do that up there because there's no roads there's no places to come out and somehow i started wondering i took my little horse and went up to the top of the mountain and looked around i thought i had my general directions although the fog was on i started back towards where i thought i could find camp riding along pretty swiftly because it was getting towards dark and the winds come up and blow away the fogs and by i say nine o'clock at night we would have what they call butter milk skies. I do. You have something like clubbers and some white clouds like buttermilk does. And the moon would shine and then go behind the cloud and then shine again. My little horse was sweating pretty heavy. So I felt led that I should stop the little fellow and let him rest. And I stopped him and tied him up pretty close, cinched him up or unchinged him, uh, the saddle rather, and tied him up close. And I sat down on the log. I was sitting there wondering, I said, oh God, how great thou art, looking around, and just then, the winds are blowing east, and I heard the most mournful noise I ever heard. I thought, what's making that real funny noise? So I looked just ahead of me, and there was an old burn over, I guess you all know what a burn over is, where there's been trees, and the fires went through and burned all the back off of them, and they're just standing there. Some of them blew down and had to get through. And every time the wind would blow, the that wind blowing down through those old light bare trees and the moon shining on them, it looked very, well, I should say, call it in a street expression, spooky. Kind of a funny feeling it give you. It looked like a graveyard, tombstone sticking up. And every time that wind would blow, that real mournful sound would set up in them trees. Oh, such a sound. And I thought, isn't that a spooky looking place? And I watched stood and looked at it a little while i thought you know this reminds me of the text i used to use over in joel said what the palmer worm has left the caterpillar has eaten what the caterpillar left has the canker worm eaten what the canker worms left the locust has eaten i thought well that shows a picture of joel and i thought yes that reminds me of that mournful noise of these great big high standing steeples on churches great big nominations behind them no but not a bit of life like the old dry cowhide 
then every time God sends down that rushing mighty wind like he did on the day of Pentecost, the only thing they can do is just groan and moan the days of miracles is past. Don't you go around such stuff. Oh, it won't do, see? Just moaning and groaning. Well, I thought, why don't them trees, what makes them moan is because they haven't got any life in them. That's the reason they are mourning. Well, I thought, if they had life in them, they could sway with this wind. Well, I said that's right. What the Lutheran left has a Methodist eaten. What the Methodist left, the Presbyterians eaten. What the Presbyterian left, the Baptist eaten. What the Baptist left, the Netherlands eaten. What the Netherlands left, the Pentecostals eaten. I said it sure come down to a big old bunch of bleak churches with nothing in them. That's exactly right. That's right. Just when a revival hits there, I'll have nothing to do with it. No, keep away from that, oh brother. That was a pretty dark picture till I happened to think that Joel said, But I will restore, saith the Lord. Then I thought, Lord, how are you going to do this? Then another great wind swept out again, and I noticed down beneath these old trees was standing up a bunch of little scrubs, just little bitty trees coming up. Little scrub fellows. But every time the wind blowed and caught into those little old trees, they would just scream and jump and hold to one another. And that's as David said, clap their hands, how they were just as flexible. If the wind blowed over here to Jones, it was all right. If it blowed them over to the assemblies, it was all right. If it blowed them back to the four square, it was all right. They were just as flexible as they could be. Everyone was so shaken together. I will restore, saith the Lord. I noticed the strange thing of it. I said, well, there's one thing. Them trees are green, but they're flexible. They got life. So you see, brother, the Holy Ghost wasn't sent for starch, stiff, dead intellectuals. It was sent for free, born-again men and women in the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit wasn't sent to the intellectual. It sent to those who are humble hearts and contrite spirits. No matter if they're educated or not educated, whether they're scrubs or whatever they are, they are flexible to the Holy Spirit. And may I ask a question to myself? I thought, oh, what makes a wind blow to begin with? Is it just because the wind wants to blow? And something seemed to say to me, no, it isn't because it wants to blow. But every time the little trees shake and give way, it loosens up the roots so they can grow deeper and get a better hold. That is the principle of a revival of people who are flexible, not to intellectual talk, but to the coming of the Holy Spirit in the form of the baptism that gives way to the Lord of God and rejoicing and is flexible in the anointing of the Spirit. What does it do to the church? It loosens up the roots of the church and makes it grow over and wrap its roots around the Jones church, and Jones wraps the roots around this church. And the first thing you know together, they are one big united forest together. All the devils in hell couldn't shake them then. But that's a trouble. That's what it is. Now notice the scriptural order it says here, I'll give you a new heart. Not a polished up one, not one that's kindly old. An old lady don't need a facelifting. She needs a birth. That's what she needs. The old church needs to be born again. Now, he never said I'll polish up the old heart. He said I'll take the old stony heart out of you and put a new one in. That new heart says right in the middle of your innermost being. The heart is the occupant place of the soul. They didn't know that in science till not long ago. The old critical science used to say, God made a mistake when he said, as a man believeth in his heart. The Bible is wrong, said there are so mental faculties in the heart. You believe with your head. If God, I'm a literalist, I don't want to spiritualize any of the word. I want to say just what the word says. I believe it that way. The Bible said it's of no private interpretation. And if God would have meant head, he'd have said head, but he said heart. So you find out that a few years ago, about three years ago now, two years ago, it's been on the headlines of the Chicago paper, there came an article that they found a little compartment in the human heart. It isn't in the animal heart or no other heart, but the human, a little place where there's not even a blood cell. And they say it is the apartment, compartment there that occupies the soul. So God was right. A man thinks with his head but believes with his heart. That's right. The intellectual will reason. Oh, I'm too bad. I can't do this. This, oh, if I ever go over there, I will be, oh, see, that's reasoning. But the heart doesn't reason. It just accepts the word the way it is and believes it. The Bible said we should cast down reasoning. That's right. We are to believe, not reason, just believe it. A new heart will I give you. 
Now, here's where many of people have made a mistake. And a new spirit will I give you. Now, he never said, I'll just polish up the old spirit, polish up the old heart, but I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Now, many people thought that to be the Holy Spirit, and they made a mistake. The Methodist thought surely they had it when they shouted, said, Brother, we got it. Anybody that shouts, but they found out there's a lot shouted didn't have it. That's right. Along comes the Pentecostal and said, When we speak with tongues, we've got it. But they found out a lot of spoke with tongues that didn't have it. That's right. You admit that. Well, now we got all kinds of everything for coming, and you haven't got it till you get it. But, brother, you haven't got it until there's a spirit of God comes from heaven and changes your life that makes the fruits of your life a different person. By their fruit, you shall know them. That's the reason you have so much ups and downs. You've got a new spirit. You quit your drinking. You get a new spirit. You quit your drink, lying. You get a new spirit. You can do most anything with that spirit. But that isn't what God's talking about. A new spirit, he said, I'll give you. Now watch. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Why? He'd have to give you a new spirit to live for him. Why? You couldn't even live with yourself. With the spirit you did have. You couldn't live with your neighbor. You couldn't associate with the next man on the next corner. You couldn't associate with his Christians. Why? You'd have an awful spirit. So he has to give you a new spirit. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Now what? And I will put my spirit in you. There's a difference. I will put my spirit in you. And there's why you find it so hard that you go down to a church and you get a different concept. You know what? I believe I ought to go to the church. Then you go back home and say, Hallelujah, I got it. No, you haven't. Then you go down to church and you say, Oh, I believe that something's happened. I don't look at things the way I used to. Hallelujah. In a few days, you find yourself right down in the same old rut you was, doubting, reasoning, everything else. Well, now, if Pastor so and so said that wasn't right, I don't believe it's right. I'll just take his word for it. And I'll tell you, I'm going to do this and do that. And you find yourself up and down and in and out, see, you just didn't go far enough. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, I got all the evidences I know. But we're not talking about evidences. We're talking about the product. That's right. Yes, sir. I've seen heathens shout. I've seen them speak with tongues. I've seen them lay down their pencils and write in our own tongues. And a witch raise up and read it, interpret it, and tell the truth. If a man could speak with tongues, if a man could shout, if a man could see visions, if a man could do any of these other things that he can do, Without divine love, they are lost. That's right. Christ is in the heart, see? So, don't be deceived by signs and evidences. There's all kinds of signs. The Bible said in the last days, false prophets will rise up and show such signs. It will deceive the very elect, if possible. Come back to the Bible signs. Notice now, I'll give you a new spirit. And I'll put my spirit. Notice the new heart is put right in the middle of you. And the new spirit is put right in the middle of you your new heart and his spirit is put right in the middle of the new spirit it's just like the mainspring in a famous watch when that when that mainspring sets in the middle of the watch it controls every movement of that watch and that's what's the matter friends now i hope you see this and i'm not saying it to try to twist or be indifferent I'm only saying it because I know that someday I'll stand in judgment with you. You see, if the Holy Spirit is in the middle of your spirit, and that what spring makes all the rest of the movements just stick just exactly to the place, keeping perfect time, when the Holy Spirit is in the middle of your spirit, it makes every action of the Holy Spirit in you tick off just exactly according to God's time piece, the Bible, right? You don't lie. You don't steal. you got associates, and you're lovely, and you've got peace, joy, and long-suffering, goodness, meekness, patience. Why all the fruits of the Spirit just sticks right with that mainspring? See what I mean? Now, it's a mainspring that does it. It's a Holy Spirit that does it. It isn't your church that does it. It isn't your pastor that does it. It isn't your shouting that does it. It isn't your speaking with tongues that does it. It isn't your healing service that does it. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. God's Holy Spirit in the middle of a new spirit. It takes, makes a new church operate. Just exactly one big bundle of love. Oh, don't we need it, friends? Examine ourselves today. Examine it by the word, see? 
is our life ticking off just like that see everything love what's the fruit of it how do you know it's keeping right time it's got love love counteth not itself is not puffed up it's sociable neighborly loving believing all things hoping all things love joy peace long suffering goodness gentleness patience meek faith all these fine qualities is sticking out of that person's life when the holy spirit's in there taking it around now it wasn't by intellectual conception that brings that this brings forth it is by the baptism of the holy ghost that brings this if you're trying to live a christian life you're only impersonating it's not paul said it's not me that liveth but christ that liveth in me the life that i now live i live not on myself but christ that liveth in me he becomes dead to the all the things of the world that christ the mainspring in his life was taken off his life just exactly exactly the way god had laid it down in the bible you get what i mean that's the reason we are fussing with one another today that's the reason there's quarreling and stewing among us that's the reason the assemblies can't believe with the oneness or high fellowship that's the reason the oneness can't believe with the assemblies that's the reason the methodists won't believe the baptists that's the reason the presbyterian won't believe with neither one that's the reason these factions and difference and fusses and stews and all this that or the other we might shout speak with tongues organize education anything that you want to call it but until god's holy spirit comes in the middle of his church and begins to fix that power of god that's what the matter see you are known you mean to tell me that the church of the living god will be ending short of that so you see we want to look into evidences instead of the main spring we want to look in what a nice case is on it what a big church we got how big the steeple is on the top of it how nice is our church is dressed and how our pastor can stand and say amen like a calf dying with the crumbs we got all these things into our church and left of the main spring for though I speak with tongues as men of angels, they have gifts like I could move mountains. Though I understand all the words, though I have all knowledge, I am nothing. Oh, I simply feel like if I could only had the knowledge or the something to express to you, my people. Oh, the people of our God don't live off the mainspring, no matter how pretty it looks, how much of a watch it looks like. If that mainspring isn't in there, it'll never keep time. Hallelujah glory we can call ourselves four square assembly presbyterian baptist we can call ourselves pentecostal whatever we want to but as long as that mainspring the holy ghost isn't there ticking off love joy peace goodness long suffering we're just putting on a show no wonder we can't have real healing services where can god lead those sincere people upon a foundation this is god's foundation no other foundation could be laid we might think we are laying the foundation but we find out the mainspring is gone the builders thought they could build the temple and the little old funny mainspring didn't seem fit to fit in anywhere they kicked it out over into the weed pile but they come to find out it was the chief cornerstone my brother sister we have had all kinds of sensations all kinds of evidences all kinds of everything else but until you come back to the mainspring of church is only just as dry as the rest of them we've got to come back to where there's something in the memo that gives him peace and joy he's always on mountaintop shouting the praise of god oh my i wish i could get you to see it then the yoke becomes easy he doesn't shuff around the collar it's lined with love if it's only lined with emotion, it will soon shift around the corner. You could come out to church and shout and dance and whatever you want to. You can go to church and sing Amen and repeat the doxology or ever so-called Apostle Creed. The Apostle Creed never was what they got wrote up. I believe in the Holy Roman Catholic Church and Communion of Saints. The Bible is against that. If the Apostles had any creed it's repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost if they had any creed it would be something like that not a communion of sins that's condemned but you might be able to see all the catechism of your church and be as a staunch Lutheran as you could be or Catholic whatever you might be or Methodist but those who have catechisms to know that catechism is not life to know the church is not life, to know the Bible is not life, but to know Him is life, the mainspring. Hmm? The spring. Now you can shout, I shall be the church, 
I can go out to the streets and somebody say, you know, you're a holy roller. Oh, it shows real bad. Someone said, well, look, I seen you down the other night shouting till your hair fell down. Well, John, I suppose if that's the way you're going to do it, you might as well get away from that group. It's shuffling, see? But when the mainspring is in there, it lines it with love. And the yoke is easy, and you can bear anything. They call you a holy roller, call you a fanatic, anything they want to. The yoke is so easy. So you can lay it up on your shoulders when you're yoked up with the mainspring. And it's not you anymore. It's him that's taking it off. It's so easy. Just like Samson with the brazen gates of Gaza, he just packed them away. And when somebody calls you a holy roller, or makes fun of you, you just pack the old burden right up to a certain mountain called Calvary and pray for them. Amen? That's when love comes. Love, that's what the world is dying for, is love. Now God wanted to show the apostles, rather, wanted to show what God's power was. Watch what his power was. He takes us over to the stillborn body of the Lord Jesus. Dead, kneels through the hands the pale chicks who's laying in the grave a roman seal over the top of the great big stone that taken many men toil up there there he laid the roman centurion said he's dead the guard said he's dead the sand is dead and everything announced him dead and they took him and laid him there for three days and nights but one morning god wants to show his power i can see a bunch of soldiers in a run like a rabbit with a hound after them just as hard as they could go while standing by the grave stands an angel that just took his finger and pushed back the stone. I can see that dead form of face with paleness, no blood, where the spear involved him. I can see the very blush of health in his cheeks. I can see him standing there hollering, all hail and all power. Yes, I can see him a few days later addressing his apostles to go into all the world and preach a gospel to every creature. And these signs shall follow them until I come. The works that I do shall you also and so forth. Watch, I begin to notice under his feet, this coming light, he begins to lift up. What is it? He breaks and defies the law of gravitation. That's power. Why was it? He was the center of gravitation. He begins to be lifted up. And if I go away, I'll come again to receive you unto myself. And there's God's power. There's a break in gravitation, you know. Let's take a little trip, just a moment. If you want to see God's power, and I ask you to be real reverent a minute before closing, Many you thoroughly understand that it isn't church, it isn't intellectuals, it isn't knowing the Bible, it isn't any of these things. It's God's love, the Holy Spirit in the middle of that spirit that you have quit drinking and quit smoking and quit lying. Then God's Holy Spirit in that spirit begins to move to make it work just exactly right. Then love, then you're on the mountain top all the time. Whether things are coming right or going right, you still got the victory. That's it. Live or die. Why? When they was going to cut Paul's head off, he said, I fought a good fight, finished a course, kept the faith, henceforth they laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Lord, the righteous judge will give me at that day, not only me, but all that love is appearing. And the grave looked back at him, and death looked back at him and said, Paul, we're going to have you in a few minutes. But that mainspring was still ticking. He said, Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is the victory? Show me where you can scare me. Show me where you can make me tick the cross off. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see it? What is it? Who are you? How big are you anyhow? Or how? Who are you anyhow? Walk around the town, you and I, and a 150 pound body is only worth 84 cents. But rather, you act like you own the country and that don't exclude preachers that's right oh i got the biggest church in the city i don't have to you might not have to do that but you might have to repent someday that's right i'm a presbyterian i don't all right go ahead see that's all right i don't mind you being a presbyterian god doesn't either but if you just got that mainspring in there that's the main thing that's the main thing if you have you won't feel the way about it I was asking a doctor the other day, oh, a few months ago, I said, Doctor, I want to ask you something. Is it true that I renew my life every time I eat? I said, yes, sir. I said, then, is it true that the 16 elements of the earth in my body are made up of 16 elements? That's right. It's well, it's the calcium, potassium, petroleum, cosmic, like all 16 different elements goes together and makes you. Now, I want to ask you, I said, when every time I eat 
it then i remember life he said that's right i said why is it i'm eating beans potatoes and meat and bread just like i did when i was 16 years old every time i eat i got bigger and stronger and now every time i eat i'm getting older and weaker and if you are pouring water out of a jug into a glass and it gets half full and then the more you pour the further down the water goes tell me by science how that's done it can't be explained only by God's word. What is it? It's an appointment, and you're going to meet it. That's right. It was appointed unto man once to die. From that to judgment, and death set into you when you was about 22 to 25. And no matter how good you treat yourself, how much Max Factor puts new lips and little thing on, it won't do one bit of good, sister. You're going right back to the appointment. That's right. You may wear a tuxedo. And shine a man with a pair of overalls on, but my brother, you are just a little bit of potash and calcium mixed together, that's all. And you know that, made out of the same kind of material. Then look, when you took a notion, your mother did, to have a little boy in her home, her and daddy, or little girl, did they call up the doctor and say, Doctor, I want you to scrape up off the earth some potash and calcium, some petroleum, and each day come and make him with brown eyes and brown hair and make it wavy and fix little sis with the long hair and manicures, whatever it is, I wish. Did he do it that way? No, sir. He couldn't do it. Though you are the dust of the earth, yet God made you and is the only one that can make you. How does he do it? Through the food genes. Where the food come from the earth? Now, just wait a minute. Now, all you Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, is that still just a minute and listen to this. All you that's so struck on your denominations and how well you can do this or what America's voice you've got and you're going to sing in the choir, be careful. You don't wobble in hell. Notice what? Now, why is it then? If I'm going to live physically, I have to eat, and the food that I eat turns into blood cells. It's a mysterious something, and they can't take that food, and no matter, no other way can they turn it into blood cells. Only God does that. Beating in your body develops. They can't get a machinery or nothing else, why? The blood cells got life in it, and they can't produce life. They can't produce life. Notice now, then every day if I live, I have to live by dead substance. Something has to die so I can live. If I eat beef, the cow died. If I eat tomato, the sheep died. If I eat fish, the fish died. If I eat bread, the wheat died. If I eat potatoes, the potato died. And the only way that I can live is by dead substance. That's what? By a new life. The Son of God gave his life. They might come back upon you. Only if something doesn't die, you do not live. And if the physical being has to live by dead substance, what about the spirit within you? Something that will die is so you will live again. Church, no an organization. Not a group of people, but the Son of God died, and that mainspring alone is how God takes his church on. Not by shaking hands, not by you might dress better or whatever more, but you live by dead substance. You might belong to a better church, or what you call a better church, you might be a nice lady. Not by intellectual, but by the spirit. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord Protest. Now, let's take a little trip. Just for a minute, did you know that God in the beginning, when this old earth stood up out of the waters, it was bleak and bare and a desert, there was not one speck of life anywhere on it. Science tells us it come from the sun. Wherever it come from, wherever it come from, there wasn't one speck of life. But now listen, if your body is made out of the dust of the earth, get it? Your body laid on this earth in the beginning, is that right? All the calcium, potash, petroleum laid on this earth at the beginning when the earth stood up out of the water. Now, what will take place, and keep this in your mind, the locusts went out of God, the great Holy Spirit, and let's visualize it. I can see him with his two big wings as he looks over the earth, and he begins to brooding over the earth. You know what brood is? That's a hen with a chicken, her brood. As she, as the Holy Spirit, begins to brood through the earth, I can see some petroleum and stuff coming together, and a little Easter lily stuck his head up for the first time on the earth then. Oh, God said, that's beautiful. It just keep brooding. After a while, grass and plants begin to come up with the earth. The Holy Spirit kept brooding. Then what happened? Along come birds flying out of the dust. The Holy Spirit kept brooding. And after a while, a man came up out of the earth and God stopped his creation. 
and he looked at them and said, this is wonderful. But Adam looked lonesome. So he goes over and takes the little rib out of the side and makes a beautiful little bride. Now, I can see them as in this day. Little Eve holding to Adam's arm as they walk down through the garden, the paradise is no death, no sorrow. She never need any makeups, no sir, she's beautiful forever. And there she was holding to Adam's arm and after a while the wind blows. And she said, oh Adam, that wind, he said, peace. And it obeyed him, he was a son of God. After a while, there come a great roar. Little Eve couldn't get scared now. No scare about it, it's perfect. Before God, a great roar come up. She never had it before, but you know, Adam had named him, he was a lion. Leo the lion, and he said, come here Leo. And the lion come over. Another girl come, you know, the shooter and a tiger. And he played with them, and they, like kittens, around Adam and Eve, till it got so late in the evening. And Adam said, and Eve said, oh Adam, the sun is going down. And he said, we must go to worship. Isn't there something about the evening time? You want to get alone? And when it was time to go to worship, he took her by the arm, like a modern son of God does, to get to his wife. And they went up to the cathedral. Oh, he didn't have a great spire on the top of it, and plushes. It was perhaps a bunch of trees standing. And as they knelt down and began to pray, the sun was going down. And the Holy Spirit that had brewed them from the dust hung that secret light into the bushes as he began to make love to them. I can hear him say, Children, have you enjoyed your stay today on the earth? And the Lord thy God hath blessed you. Oh, yes, Father, we have enjoyed this. Oh, we should love you to take a place. He said, Children, the sun is going down. I come down to kiss you good night. You know what it is? I just love her to take my wife by the hand. I go to the bed with my little Joseph and pick his little hands up and say, Mother, look at it. It just looks something like your hand. She said, Dad, you know, I believe his eyes, he said, just like yours. See, we were made in the image of God. And that's strain so that makes us love it. And how I kiss little Joseph goodnight, sleep over little Sarah and kiss her goodnight, go to little Rebecca and kiss her goodnight. There's something in my heart that just, oh, just love. And when God kissed his soft, little family good night and now I lay thee down to sleep he laid down a little lion he laid down the cheetah and the tiger and nothing could harm them father was watching over them no harm or danger could come do you know we're on a road back now they were the children of God because the Holy Spirit had brought them from the earth now notice be real reverend just a moment notice close after that scene came in now look what it done it mad man. God won't be defeated. This woman did what she did and has to bring life into the world. God brings you to the world, brings you out of the dust of the earth, just as no other piling up of cosmic lights and things will ever do it. You can't bottle up enough light. You can't put enough petroleum with it. It will never make a human being. Only God can do it. And God made you what you are. How do you do it? Out of the dust of the earth. Now look. If you've taken the Holy Spirit to brood me from the earth, to call me out of the dust of the earth, and now I am based on the basis of free moral agency to receive it or to turn it down. If I want life, I can have it. If I can want to refuse it, I'm a free moral agent. I can take the devil then. But if I want God, I can take God. And that's before every person that ever come on the earth. But look. By my own mental conceptions, I can't have it. What is it? It took the Holy Spirit to bring me from the earth. And if the Holy Spirit made me what I am without having any choice, how much more can he bring me back onto the dust of the earth by choice? Not my intellectuals, not my church membership, but the Holy Ghost that's putting down and calling to me and answer back to it. He raised his hands and swore that he'd raised me up the last days. Oh, brother. Intellectual will never do it. Mental conception will never do it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that hangs, that brings a human being to this place. Make your choice, oh happy day. I fix my choice on thee. I say that my God, no matter what the rest of the world does, it's sinking sun. My choice is on thee. The Holy Spirit that's moving down through his word, saying, This is my word. Man shall not live by the Lord, but by every word that consider the other matter of God. Yes. Holy Spirit, I promise eternal life to them that believe. I believe Holy Spirit, I'll see you, then watch your life begin to move, not the church, the Holy Spirit, 
not the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Now, what happens? When the Holy Spirit has gone out of a man, the Bible says the devil has gone out of the man, he walks in dry places and comes back to found the house all swept out. You know what happens? He once lived in old Tin Can Alley, that's right, where all the devils and rats and everything else lived, fusses and fights and stews and arguments. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, he can't live in a place like that. That's the reason people today can shout and scream and go on living a kind of a life afterwards. The Holy Spirit, when it moves in, it takes God's big bulldozer and comes down and takes that old alley up, throws the dirt out, buries it in the sea of forgetfulness and terraces of a nice big place and puts up a great big mansion and he lives there and the flowers of love joy peace long suffering goodness and mercy and kindness and faith is blooming around this house glory that's it i just got to quit preaching i haven't even got my text good yet look that's it when the holy spirit moves in the chain cans and the rats the lies but quitting selfishness and difference the other christians all move out and you still got them it shows holy spirit has never terrorized out your life yet amen get rid of your rats the Holy Ghost takes away them differences. It makes you full of love, joy, peace. Look at the flowers blooming around. Satan just can't step his dirty foot on there. For your life is dead and you're hidden God through Christ and sealed by the Holy Ghost. Then what comes forth by the Holy Spirit living there? These flowers just actually accompany the Holy Spirit. Now, you can't go and get some of these artificial flowers and set them out in the yard because they haven't got any life in them. And you say, well, I joined church. I guess I'm just going to have to be this away. You are miserable, wretch. That's right. But when the Holy Ghost is there, he just automatically loves. Oh, I could pull every hair in her head out. Um, the old oneness, that old trinity, that old this, that or the other. Oh, I wouldn't speak to her. Will I go down that meeting? Why? It's just you old Pharisee. A Pharisee means an actor. You're only trying to act religious. If you had the real Holy Ghost in there, he'd put a love in your heart for every man that believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pharisee means actor. You're trying to act something that you're not. You got an artificial flower. Your house is made out of pasteboard and rats has eaten it up. That's right, the Holy Ghost runs the church. The Holy Ghost is the love of God. When men who try to express love of God, one of them said, if the whole ocean was ink, and the skies of parchment made every stalk on earth a quail, and every man a scrub a tree to write the love of God above. Oh, drink the ocean run, not for the scroll, contain the whole, those stretch from sky to sky. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what Phoenix needs, that's what the world needs, that's what the church has got to have, and love, and joy, and, and then all the scrapple that settled, and we are one big area church going on to the glory of God. Let us pray. Think it over, it's up to you. This is the word. Will you receive it or will you turn it down? Are you guilty? Are you living in the devil's alley, trying to make yourself act like a Christian? Or is the love of God just flowing out? And the flowers are blooming forever, right around of God's great big holy house, where the holiness of God just actually brings up these flowers. A sweet smelling savior is around all the time. You don't hear any criticism, you don't pay attention to it, no matter. It's just as sweet and easy because the Holy Spirit is in there taking off your life. If it's not, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, would you raise your hand, not to me, but to God, and say, God, be merciful to me and give me that type of life. Would you do it? God bless you, 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 and you, 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 yes. Over there, you, God, sees every hand. He you knows your desire. Up in the back, is anywhere. Now remember, friends, I'm only a minister. I can only speak as he tells me to speak. I try to follow him and stay in the word. Now, if that life doesn't accompany you, it, no matter if I speak in Christ's name, you say, Brother Branham, I've had some wonderful experiences. That doesn't do it, Brother Jesus said, by the experience you shall know them but by the fruits shall you know them what is the fruit of the spirit joy long suffering meekness love patience kindness gentleness faith does that accompany your life don't be deceived we are the end of the road friends this might be the last time you get a chance to check up better do it how many more here many of you are to raise your hand 
you know enough. God bless your son. God bless you. Someone else raise your yeah? God bless you. Just raise your hands. God will see you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless someone else. God bless sis. God bless you. Someone else. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. The balcony. Now, you're the judge. Remember, I, God bless you, lady. You put in prayer. I'm going to stand at the face. Your face at the judgment bar. And you're going to give an account for what you do with these messages after noon. Your mind, the way you're thinking now, is going to vibrate on God's radar screen at the day of judgment. If it's a thousand years from today, it will still vibrate. What do you think about it? Is um, there is that stuff in your life? A message is prophecy is given. When with the weeds, the heads bowed, there's word of God to you. The message backed up exactly what I said now. Would you come in confession upon the preaching of the word, the witness of the spirit? Now you know your heart. I don't know your heart. Walk down here, right down around the altar. Here, let me get you by the hand here. Let's stand here and pray and ask God to take that old selfishness out of you, them old ups and downs that's shaping you, and come here and stand here and get a new spirit in your life today. Or is it by I will be shouted. I spoke with tongues. That's all right. That's good. That's fine. But I'm talking about something else. Come down here now. Get the main screen in your heart. That thing. God bless you, sir. That's good to walk right out to the first one. I like that. Come right on down here now. If you're without that type of life after tonight, maybe too far for you. Now you see, I belong to church. No matter what you belong to, you come here. You ought to belong to Christ if you're guilty. Come, that's right. Come right out of the balcony. Come on down. Now remember, what you said by Branham. I've had the messages so many times. This may be our last one too. While I am waiting, being prayer everywhere, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold of my being. After the sway, O God, fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Do you want to be that filled with the spirit till everyone will know Christ only, always living in me? Come right on. Come on. You know, friends, there's more than that here. We, Lord, for your praying, say such. Lord, search me now. Have thine own way. Thou art the porter. The Holy Spirit is to bring our work. I am the clay. You want him to bring you together in a real good to raise you up. Mold me and make me. Not after me, after some church bit. After the will. I am waiting. Yielded and still of being prayer. I just feel, I don't know, I just feel that someone's not just exactly honest with the, yourself. If you want to be honest with yourself, how can you ever be honest with God? How could you? God bless you, sir. Now, if you in your own heart know that you're not living a joyful, peaceful life of the Spirit, yielded to the potter, everything just wonderful, God on the scene, and you want to be honest enough with yourself to come, receive it, how could you be honest with, enough with God? See, calm down. There's numbers of you here are to be standing here. Don't tell me I don't know, for I do. Not me, but the Spirit of God tells me so. See, once more now, that's right. Come right on. God bless you, people. How thine. Now you just pray while you're doing this. Have your own way, Lord. Bring up my old selfish way. That's right. That's the way. Have thine own way. Thou art the portal. I am the good about this idea. Move in here, me. Make me and after the will. While I am waiting, oh God, you're dead and still. Let's have thine own way. Have thine own way. Search me and try me. Try me by what the word. Master, I pray. Whiter than snow, Lord. Wash me just now. Once you come, let's have you move right up. You that feels just a little strain that would keep you out. What if this is the, the last hour of life? How do you know it's not the last hour of life? You are showing forth an honest effort. The word has went forth in the Holy Spirit. The trouble of it is, with women and the people, we get too self seeded See, God wants us to make us different. God wants to put that in your hearts. He wants us to be real. Listen, friends, let me tell you this. Why take us up to church when the Pentecostal sky is loaded with the real thing? Why try to lay upon some fantastic? 
Why should we rely upon some little motion or some little something or other? There's nothing to when Pentecostal skies are just crowded with the real thing. Don't take a substitute, you can get the real. Paul said, All these things I do have pass away. Our tongue will cease, everything else will go. But when love has come, it will end your forever sure. Don't take a substitute, no, sir. I want the real one. Or I want to live. I want to be a real Christian. And I don't want to be anything like it. I want the real, nothing but the real. It's here for you. Pentecostal skies are just loaded right now. Pentecost is not domain assemblies. Pentecost don't mean altogether false way. Pentecost is not a domination. Pentecost is an experience. Experience, experience that constrains you to the love of God. Then, what is this other thing? His attributes, apples that fall off the tree, see? But don't get the apple for the tree. Get the tree until bear the apples. You can have all the signs and fantastics. You want to pick up under the tree and still not have the tree. The tree's got the life, you see. You're just taking something that fell off the tree. Get the tree first and it'll bear itself. But if your tree isn't shielding these things, then there's something wrong. That's right. That's what you want. My look, standing here. Are the rest of you satisfied? You made the right decision, say Brother Burnham. What difference does it make? Well, it's just a difference between death and life. You mean that if I walk up there and stand there, what if I don't get nothing? Well, brother, what can you lose by proving to God that you want to make an effort to get it? How are you ever going to get it sitting there like that? Get up, get up, raise up and walk up, confess before the people, but these people here, members of the churches, and they're witnessing before God and before you that they know their life is short of these things. They might have spoken tongues, they might have prophesied, they might have preached, they might have done all these things, but yet they know that something in there is just not there, and they're willing to confess it. You mean the God of heaven won't look down and honor that? He's got to. He that will come to me, I will always turn him out. I believe his blessed word, and I believe that every sincere heart setting here beating this life will get something from this prayer now. I believe it. Just think what we Pentecostal churches got into. Let's take the psalm of life a minute. Be not like dumb driven cattle, have to be herded into a pen or something or another. Be a hero, stand out there. Lives of great men or reminders, we can make a lot sublime with patterns left behind us, footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing of a life swollen main for a fall on and sugar brother, seeing shall take heart again. Oh, my blessed friend of Christ, see your confession. Now, don't stand here thinking you are not going to get something when the whole sky is full of blessings. You might not be all worked up over it. Maybe you've had a, a lot of that already. It ain't working up over. It isn't getting worked up, the emotional. It's just reverently before God is coming there and saying, God, now I believe and you put in me that which operates my life. How many of you standing here believe it? Let's see your hands. You are already making a confession to God. You're raising up and standing here proves that you're sincere in it, proves that you are. Now I want to pray for you first, and then I want you to pray for yourself. But first, I want you to settle down. Everybody now, if you all feel that you're absolutely justified in doing what you're doing, if you're sure that you're justified. There's not a spot on you. You know where, but your life is ticking just according to God's Holy Spirit, making you live the life of this Bible. If you're satisfied, remember, this day will come into judgment. Brother, I tell you, I'd rather walk out in the face of my pastor, church, and everything, and make it right now than to try to do it then. You're in judgment then, all right? Promises, several promises are given, oh my May the Lord, more messages are given. Now everyone, O oh Lord, our oh God, how we thank thee for these, these that are standing now. Solemnly, Lord, we come in the face of every enemy, we present ourselves as a sacrifice to thee. And as one day when Israel was being just about, the enemy was going to take the camp, and the king was speaking. A man raised up in the midst of them and prophesied and told them which way to go up. And O oh God, they found that the enemy was so confused that they kill each other. And Israel took their spoils. Oh God, in this hour, when there's so much confusion over the world, 
a digital group now come to the Lord God and be the special wheel of the Holy Spirit. This one that Ezekiel saw as a wheel in the middle of the wheel turning the up in the air. Oh, I pray that in every heart that's present, oh eternal Jehovah God, oh the great I am, the sufficient one, the one who walked, called Abraham to his bosom. All these are children, oh may we now take a hold of the bosom of God and begin to nurse. Oh, grant it, Lord. Maybe believer who knows how to reach up to faith and take the hold of God's eternal word and nurse the body that's great and the precious Holy Spirit. Take away all guilt and condemnation. Take all the guilt away. And may from this very day, may the Holy Spirit of love, joy, peace, and meekness, and gentleness, and patience set in every heart here, Lord. I a servant, I intercede for this group with all my heart. I offer you, Lord, this is a fruit of the sermon. This is a thing that I am presenting to you as a gospel preacher. I give this to you, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. That the spirit of love and peace and joy and understanding and meekness and gentleness will set into each heart. May the Holy Spirit melt down the cold, starched, indifferent. May every true bitterness be grabbed out by God's sharp grabbing hole and may the springs of water fly from heaven pouring down upon the parched soul and the fruits of the spirit bloom up from this water of life from the smitten rock oh eternal god grant the blessings just keep your hands up in the air now and let us pray you will pray now while some hand laid for the holy ghost now these brothers who's praying with you just keep your hands up don't you leave where you're standing until something happened in your heart to change you all right brother